Hello everyone, welcome to the latest edition of The Front Page. What have we learned since we were last with you? Well, we've learned that there isn't any new money to promote British Racing's premier grand plan. There isn't enough money to support British Racing's aftercare work, but there was enough money to tempt the connections of El Fabiolo and John Bon onto the track over the weekend and they both scored and are now perhaps on course to meet each other at Ascot in January. All that and more in this week's edition with myself Lee Mottisett and my esteemed colleagues Chris Cook and Jonathan Harding. Hello to you both and Chris since we were last on air you have once again become an HWPA winner, the Racing Writer of the Year. What an honour to have we with us, sir. Oh, well, thanks very much. Yeah, I was very pleased to win that one. First time winning that award. Um, and I, for a little while, I got carried away with myself and thinking, what a genius I must be. And then I looked down the <laughs> list of winners and, and found out that here in the room with us, we've got someone who's already won it four times. So, uh, yeah, I'm obviously not impressing you. It's only three. Oh, well, it's just four on the list. They, they obviously need a good subbing. No, I, 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 I was I was robbed one year clearly, but no, it was it was no. no. They've retrospectively and turned it around for you. They were very quiet years too. I mean, you 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 won against extremely hot competition and deservedly so as well, Jonathan. So. We we were both losing. We were. Nominees. Yeah, we got the Last little week. mini glass trophy yeah. that I'm slowly building quite a collection of. But um, good day anyway, and. Um, Finishing second to Nick Luck, there's no real shame in that, I don't think. Yeah, no, it was it was a good do, good grub, and an excellent main award winner who will be talking to us in this edition about British Racing's aftercare service. I'll be talking to you about Premier Racing. Jonathan Harding is going to kick things off with the weekend racing, what happened on the track and also off the track. Yeah, where would you like to start? On the track. On the track. So we had two seriously good horses run, and we had two seriously good horses not run. Um, so Constitution Hill and Shishkin were unsurprisingly, but fairly late on in the day, ruled out of the rearranged fighting fifth at Sandown on what you'd call, what Nicky Henderson would deem to be attritional ground, what was heavy ground by the official description, I believe, on the hurdles course. But we also were lucky to watch two very good horses who did compete um, on either side of the Irish Sea. So we had John Bond win the Tingle Creek against uh, his old foe, Edward Stone, uh, in fairly, you know, not eye-catching manner, but in, in an efficient manner anyway. He's not received any major cuts for the champion chase. And his chief rival, one day later, did, well, was very similar type of performance in the hilly way, El Fabiolo winning that despite nearly throwing it away at the final fence, but he just about managed to uh, keep his balance. So seasons just feels like it's starting to kick into gear a little bit more now when you see the likes of John Bornell, Fabiolo, those, those big championship horses coming out. So a good weekend, uh, yeah, good weekend at Sandown and over in Ireland. Um, we'll also talk about something that happened at Aintree that wasn't on the track shortly. Um, but first of all, um, Chris, John Bond, mm. El Fabiolo, who impressed you the most? Uh, I, I suppose El Fabiolo. Uh, if I'd lumped on him at, what was he, fives on? Yeah. I'd had my heart in my mouth at that last fence. <laughs> he took, I think, an extra stride that the yeah. jockey wasn't quite expecting and, you know, scrambled about a bit on landing. And you, you've seen that happen sometimes where they don't quite yeah. get their footing back and tip over the side. But it, that didn't happen to him, thankfully. Um, I, I slightly, I, I always worry about predictability in horse racing. You know, you, you want these races yeah. to be competitive, but what yeah. we're talking about at the weekend is two odds-on winners. Yeah. And one of them is now odds-on for the Queen Mother Champion Chase. And uh, uh, Except I think there's two firms that still offer even money. Three months ahead of the big day, I, I, I don't like odds-on shots no. for the Cheltenham Festival. I mean, obviously Constitution Hill is going to be odds-on. Um, you know, he's actually won the race before and, you know, has beaten everything else. Um, El Fabiolo is a sort of former novice stepping up for the first time. You know, he shouldn't be that short. We ought to have, you know, two or three horses that are going to take him on that, you know, might give him a proper race. But, you know, John Bond's the next best one and he's already beaten him. Um, so, uh, you know, that's not so great. But they are two good horses and, you know, John Bond is improving. Um, it, that turned into a bit of a slog, didn't it, on Saturday? Yeah. Um, it, it didn't show him to best advantage, but, uh, you know, I can, I can just about buy that he 
might make it more of a fight in March. I think it was the slowest Tingle Creek for 18 years. So, I mean, it's hard for a horse to look really flashy in those circumstances. Yeah, on, on, on Tingle Creek morning, we weren't sure there would be a Tingle Creek either, were we? So, which yeah. underlines that the ground was... But that's not altogether an unusual experience with Sunday no. in December, in fairness. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, w one interesting, before we move away from the Tingle Creek, I guess, is that, um, I mean, for some, we, we could get these two together in the Clarence House chase um, with echoes of Shishkin via Nergamine. Um, in the same race for the for the same connections. Great, if it yeah. Has, yeah, it would be great. That um, has to be good news, doesn't it? Yeah, it does because we want to see these horses clashing outside of the spring festival. So that that would be um, really good news. If they do meet, or whether basically whether John Bond runs next, I guess connections have an interesting decision to make as well. In that um, Aidan Coleman had been the horses or has been the horse's regular rider, having picked up the ride initially because Nico de Boinville was injured in a schooling incident at home. Mm. Aidan Coleman is currently injured, which or has been, but he's injured, which means that Nico de Boinville um, has ridden the horse in his two runs this season. The expectation is that Aidan Coleman will be back soon, which is great news. Um, but I guess it means that Connections have a decision to make as to who rides the horse. Yeah, and I sense from the from what I've heard from the sort of press huddle after the race that JP McManus gave that question fairly short thrift when he was asked who's going to ride him next time, suggesting in, in very politely that he wasn't going to get into that. It is a difficult decision to make because obviously Aidan Coleman coming back, fantastic jockey in his own right, but it's going to take a minute to get up to that level that he'd expect himself to be at, particularly in time for the Clarence House potentially. If he's just come back, you don't want to be thrown into a a, a big one like that necessarily and you do lack a bit of match practice but I'd envisage he would take the ride back. I don't, I don't see a reason other than the fact that unless they keep it with Nico de Boinville this season and go you start fresh next, I don't know. Um, it was also fighting fifth day um, at Sandown on Saturday which is not something we said before. Um, two things to talk about from that. Um, we didn't get Constitution Hill or Shishkin in the race um, as we had hoped we would get on Saturday. But whereas in the past there's been a bit of hoo-ha, furore and uh, disappointment mm. uh, expressed where Nick Henson has, has pulled out horses from some big races late in the day, there seemed to be, or am I, am I wrong about this because I was, I, was, I was out the country on Saturday, there seemed to be greater understanding that this was probably a, a fair and understandable move, given that the Christmas hurdle is only 17 days away, same as the King George for... Very for, understandable, for but I, I find the, the whole process a bit frustrating because, you know, there were two things that could have happened that would have made that Fighting Fifth a really interesting race. You know, either Constitutional and Shish can show up and, you know, that's interesting. Or maybe at the start of the week, you know, Nikki says, well, look, there's rain in the forecast. Sand is always difficult this time of year. We've got a Christmas hurdle coming up. I'm not going to enter them. In which case, you'd have got you know, quite a few other horses, I think, interested in turning up um, for what was a decent prize on the Saturday, and that would have been a really interesting race in itself. You know, not quite the same quality if Constitution Hill isn't there, but competitive. Um, and instead, we sort of fell between the two. You know, they're going to turn up, they're going to turn up, and then they didn't, and you were left with just the four. Highly rated, I mean, we've got three horses rated above 150. Um, I think out of the top 10 hurdlers in Britain, you yeah. know, they... Well, that's it, they probably aren't, they probably aren't all in there. <laughs> that's, um, that's probably it. But well, I, th I think you could have got a better field if you didn't have that threat of running into this unbeatable champion. Um, so, you know, I thought that was a bit of a pity. It, it turned into a good race anyway, popular winner. Not so you know, sleepy, cracking horse. Yeah, you, you, you always tend to get small fields for these races, don't you? But uh, I, it just made me wonder if, as a sport, we need to be a little bit more agile in certain circumstances. I wondered about, you know, giving the stewards the power in consultation with the BHA maybe to reopen a grade one if by 8 a.m. on the morning of suddenly the odds-on favourite disappears through a trapdoor. I mean, could you say, you know, any horse that can get here in the next three or four hours, you know, you can run, <laughs> and, you know, un unless the stewards decide that, you know, you're, you're not rated high enough or you're not qualified for, for some other reason. Even if you got uh, just a couple of extra horses for the Fighting Fifth, that would have made it a more interesting race. Would it have been a more interesting race, a better race, if the race hadn't been staged at Sandown? Because obviously there was debate, uh, including in the Racing Post and elsewhere last week, about the decision to uh, rehome the Fighting Fifth at Sandown. Of course, it should have been staged at Newcastle the week before. That was under mm. frost and snow. Um, representative of, of Northern Racing have said, well, look, we had a fixture at Aintree on Saturday, a great Northern track, 
Um, why on earth did you stage the fighting fifth at Sandown down in leafy Surrey when entry could have staged a race? Weatherby had hoped to stage a race, or as it turned out, that was abandoned as well. Um, was it a surprising move or, or, or was it reality that if Constitution Hill was going to run the race, it was only going to be um, at Sandown? Uh, ITV's main base was Sandown. What do we think? I, mean, I, I don't object to it turning up at wherever the feature meeting happens to be the following Saturday. That's the way we always do it with these yeah. restage races, isn't it? And you know that's where most of the people in the circus are. So I mean that that made sense to me. Um, I, I can see why people in the north would be annoyed, but but I mean Aintree's conditions on Saturday, as it turned out, were absolutely attritional. Um, I mean. There was a four-runner beginner's chase where three of them pulled up, and yeah. you know, there was a handicap hurdle that was was it 78 seconds over standard. I mean, not you know, it, it wouldn't have been a, a fast race there either. No. Um, I mean, I'm sure much may be said on both sides, but it, it, it didn't bother me. Bother you? No, I mean similarly. I think it was this was probably just a logistical decision. They're looking at three meetings or whatever it was, and thinking which ones are most likely to be on. Um, and given the ground they got at Aintree in the end, you think Sandown was the one that was never really, for all they held an inspection on the morning, it was never really in doubt that it would go ahead. It was in doubt that it would be too testing for a Constitution Hill, but we always knew we were going to get racing on Saturday, was my understanding. I think it's just something to keep in mind. It's worth flagging. You can understand why they'd be frustrated, and it certainly wouldn't be the first time it's happened. Otherwise, it wouldn't be sort of creating so much of a, a debate. Um, I think it's just worth flagging, but in this case, it was probably the right call. OK. Um, where there was um, also uh, debate and conversation in relation to entry was not so much in the bitch chase, fine race though that was, but in a fight that took place there on Saturday. Uh, social media footage um, uh, brought that to uh, wider public consumption. It was not pretty viewing. The Jockey Club uh, have commented on it since. Um, John, do you just feed us up on that? Yeah, so I was looking after this story yesterday. So footage emerged online about 40 seconds of a group of males, shock horror, um, punching and kicking and grappling and you name it, uh, at Aintree. The most disappointing thing for me, well, two things. One, by the last count that I had yesterday afternoon, it had been viewed more than 1.2 million times, which is not good, is it, when you no. think Ugh. what people associate with the day at the races. Two, there was a, a sort of heartbreaking comment underneath by a user. Obviously, I can't, you know, you've got to verify these things, but just the tone was basically saying, well, that's, I was there, I witnessed this, and that's the last time I'm going to go to one of these big meetings, because you just, that, that is, there's always the possibility that some people will take take it too far and, and, and again this isn't specifically a racing issue you get madness wherever you go any big event where there's alcohol involved but it does seem to happen reasonably frequently more frequently than you would like on race courses and it's just a terrible look and I think I don't think we're just talking about alcohol are we realistic no of course yeah. no that's the thing and it's just you it's inexcusable behaviour, it's abhorrent, it's awful. Um, the question then is, if it's a given that these things can happen, what's being done to prevent it? There, you can see security guards in the footage, you might say being a little bit uh, light in their approach, I'm being generous. They, they yeah. weren't doing enough, were they? No. And, I mean, if there are guys out there who are thinking, you know, we'll go to the races and have a fight, you know, they're not going to be put off by those guards, are they? I mean, I, I think you, you need to have people who are prepared to get involved and, and try and do something a little bit more proactive to, to just dampen these things down and, um, you know, protect the innocent. Um, uh, because otherwise, more and more stuff like this is going to happen. It, it's, we've had this in the past. It's usually oh, a summer have, thing. We have, we have. And, yes. uh, and it, it seems to me that we, it goes in cycles. Like, you know, once you've had like two consecutive weekends, then the next race course that's staging a big Saturday fixture gets mm. the sniffer dogs in and amnesty boxes at the gates and things seem to calm down. Um, and then we sort of get a bit complacent about it and stop doing that kind of stuff and it all starts up again. And as you said, it's not just alcohol, is it really? We, we know it's not. Um, the use of drugs on race courses has been widely discussed and debated before. I referenced in a piece earlier this year that at a meeting at Ascot, um, I saw a line of young guys go into one of the gents' toilets right. and it was pretty obvious what they, what they were doing. In fact, they were brazen about it. 
um, and I've seen something similar since at another race course. Uh, and it, we know that alcohol plus cocaine is not a great combination for public order and we know that it's a battle that racing yeah. realistically is not winning. It's just where the buck stops, isn't it? Because it's easy to just throw your hands up and say, well, you know, you're always going to get idiots. It's not our fault. These things happen. People get drunk and they do stupid things. You can't, you can't sort of allow for the, or you need to allow, sorry, for the fact that occasionally you're going to get a few bad apples. But I think, you know, if a football club has major fan disruption or problems, that football club essentially is the one that's sanctioned because they are responsible for whoever is on the premises, whoever is attending those mm -hmm. games. Similarly, race courses have to be responsible for what yeah. happens on the race course. Yeah. Whether, you know, it's unfortunate because they obviously don't, it's not up to them. They can't decide whether people are going to be stupid, but they can decide to put the right measures in place to limit the possibility of that, which I'm sure they do. But surely more can be done if this is happening and particularly with the response to it that we saw at Aintree. Um, if we're talking about more can be done, more should be done, we move on to our second story in a neat little link. I what think. a segue. Thank you. Um, Premier Racing, um, Premier Race Days are British Racing's grand plan for 2024 and beyond. As a reminder, if you've not heard about Premier Racing, the sport will stage 170 premier race days next year, top tier race days, a place for sport's best product. And those race days are, it is hoped, will boost uh, betting turnover on British racing, strengthen the top end of the sport, and also boost fan retention and fan engagement. Money is being pumped into those race days in terms of prize money. Um, but we're only now a few weeks, well, we're three weeks away from the first Premier Race Day on January 1, News Day at Cheltenham. And so far, nothing has been seen uh, publicly about promotion of these days, about marketing of these days. There's been no public sighting of any logo or even any branding relating to Premier Race Day. So what is going on while well, I penned a piece? for the Racing Post last week that tried to bring us up to date on where we are. And a crucial aspect of this is that Great British Racing, British Racing's marketing arm, has been given no additional money to promote markets or advertise Premier Race Days. That is of concern to, to many in the sport, including the Chief Executive of Plumpton, Craig Stadden, who stages a Premier Race Day on January 7th. And instead of the minute, Joe Public, in his words, wouldn't know what Premier Racing is. And that is really worrying for them because many people feel that Premier Racing is a great opportunity for the sport. But if the people don't know about Premier Racing, um, how on earth are they expected to go along to those race days? Um, GBR Chief Executive uh, Rod Street explained in the piece that money from within his budget, his 1.6 million a year budget, which is paltry compared to most other sports, money from that budget would be redeployed initially into Premier Race Day promotion. And there was a hope that more money could be sourced from the levy board deeper into 2024. Levy board chief executive, Alan Del Monte, explained to me that um, that might well be the case, but that had the sport moved sooner, then money could potentially have been freed up from levy board resources for promotion of Premier Race Days. Um, not everybody is worried. Uh, Nick Smith from Ascot said that Ascot's position is that until we see if Premier Race Days really do boost betting turnover, there's no point spending a lot of money on consumer engagement. While other people in the sport take the view that maybe Premier Racing won't work, and if it won't work, what's the point of spending a fortune of money the sport doesn't already have on a concept that might not even work? It's a bit worrying, particularly to those who, who feel it does work, because you'd, they would say that if you don't spend money on promoting it, how people know about it? Um, I spoke to Jed, Jed Shields, who is a big uh, marketing industry uh, figure. He was the guy who, uh, when working for Ron Seal, came up with the, uh, the logo. It does exactly what it says on the tin, and he was really critical of British Racing's approach to this. In general terms, he said that the, the sport had gone, gone the wrong way around this and it, it was already creating a structure without really knowing who that structure 
is targeted for and that the marketing should have come at the start, not the end of the process. He described the, uh, the amount of money being used to promote it as pathetic and hopelessly inadequate. And he even said that the plans to uh, promote uh, the, the premier racing were at the minute vague as hell and all about um, love and peace, not nearly specific enough. That then is where we are. It's not great, is it, Chris, that three weeks away from the first Premier Race Day, the public, we have seen no logo, uh, no branding, no promotion, and there ain't no new money to do any of that anyway. If you read about this happening to a different sport, one that you weren't connected with, had no particular love for, you would say, what a flaming bin fire that is, wouldn't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. You'd be like, thank God that's not us. Um, it's so half-arsed, it's just embarrassing. Um, you, you, when you're trying to promote your product, you're not supposed to miss a chance to make a song and dance about it and say, this is how good we are. So we should obviously have seized the chance to say, well, we're, we're relaunching horse racing. We're going to have this premierized yeah. racing every Saturday and, you know, come along to these specific fixtures. And uh, we haven't done that. And, and it, it matters because, as I understand it, this is still supposed to be a two year experiment. Yeah. And we're, at the end of it, we're supposed to be able to look back at the results and go, has it been a success or a failure, one or the other, carry on with it or not? Yeah. Um, but it's not going to be a full-blown experiment if we're not ready right at the beginning yeah. to, you know, to promote it as it should be promoted. Uh, you know, I, I, I sort of go some way down the track with what Nick Smith was saying. You know, we need to sort of feel our way forward and, um, and learn as we go. But if you're going to make decisions about, about this uh, as to whether you're going to carry on with it in the future, you know, it all needed to be ready to go right from the beginning. Um, and it doesn't see that doesn't seem to be the case. And, and you're asking lots of race courses to make sacrifices about the timing of their fixtures, which would normally be on a Saturday afternoon and now will yeah. not be. And they're losing out. And in the meantime, you're still kind of muddling around, not quite sure which way you're going. It's um, it's worrying and disappointing for people who care about the game. But as you say, Johnny, it's, it's not surprising. We've said on this programme in the past that when we've discussed Premier Racing, one of the worries would be, would the sport have any money to actually make the best of it, to promote it, to sell it to people. Uh, that was always a concern. Um, but to learn that no new money has been allocated to this, that, that Rod Street's team, and I make the point in the piece, GBR has a full-time team of nine. There are more chief executives than that on the, on the sports commercial committee. So it's a really, compared to other sports, it's a small team and a small budget to spend on marketing. That, 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 that money has to come from within that mm. to, to promote this. And yes, racecourses will spend some of their own money and there might be future levy board uh, funding to come and GBR could dip into its own reserves. But if this is a rebrand, if you like, of the top end of British horse racing, to have no resources really to, to get that message out there just feels like, almost makes it feel pointless. Yeah, and you, the thing is we, we got quite excited, well excited, we got slightly enthused by the idea that there were these radical changes and you had Julie Harrington saying we need to be brave and we need to, you know, once more onto the breach and there's a whole new concept that's going to you know, save racing might be a little bit dramatic, but it was in need of fairly radical changes. The idea that it's not a fully joined up approach and that marketing's, marketing it has essentially been an afterthought by the sounds of it. You know, we've got this whole schedule right, ready to go January 1st, and oh, wait a minute, we haven't told anyone about it. It's just extraordinary, unsurprising, and I don't quite know where you go. I think the same, to, to speak to Chris's point, when you come to the end of the two years, you've already got a caveat for all that yeah, data. Exactly. There's already a caveat that, well, maybe if we'd promoted it a bit more, it would have... The very thing you don't want is to be sort of yeah. looking back at the data and going, well, we need to put an asterisk there. You know, we can explain that away. Well, it's just a two-year experiment. You, you needed results you could have faith in. Yeah. And we're already thinking that won't be the case. You can't magic up the money, but it just feels like it's constantly... And I don't want to dig into it because I, I, I like the concept. I like the fact that changes are being made. It's people pulling in the same direction. But it already feels a little bit like you've, it's almost been rushed. To So keen are we to have radical change that we haven't thought about how you 
actually do it properly. Well, that's right, because where we are, um, it will um, disappoint and annoy those people who don't think that Premier, premier Racing is a good idea because so, we, we've, we've done all this, we've sacrificed these Saturday meetings and you, you're not spending any money on it. But it will also disappoint and anger those people who do believe in Premier yes. Racing because they'll say this is a great opportunity for the sport, but if we don't tell people about it in a really effective way, then it's a wasted opportunity. So a lose-lose situation is what we've created. Yeah, it was, well done, it was quite interesting. Um, Nick Luck had an interview that was shown on Luck on Sunday yesterday with the chief executive of the Hong Kong Jockey Club, very f broad ranging and uh, Hong Kong's obviously a unique scenario, but you'd call that a relatively healthy, well, <laughs> very, <laughs> relatives of Britain, but generally yeah. speaking, that's a healthy racing jurisdiction. Yeah. And he was asked, what would the main thing, what would you say to British racing and indeed the world's racing jurisdictions? What's Hong Kong done right? And they were saying many years ago they had a, a extensive and I presumably very expensive piece of research into what do customers actually want and he said that British racing has to be customer centric above all else and it's almost as though they've done the logistics of premier racing they've looked at the program they've done all of that they haven't actually thought what do the customers want I suppose they have with betting turnover but in great depth and how do we get the word out to those customers more importantly which is pretty much exactly what Jed Shields. It lives and dies. It lives and dies with that. You can do all these wonderful things, put all the bells and whistles on, but if people aren't going and people don't know about it, it's wasted time. Because ultimately, horse racing, like any other sport, is a form of entertainment, and your prime or target group has to be the people that you are trying to entertain. Um, from that, in better news. How would you like to win two tickets to the Cheltenham Festival? Well, you can. What a wonderful Christmas present that would be. Here is how you can make it happen. And good luck with your entries for the competition. We hope to see you at Cheltenham next March. Um, final story this week is led by Racing Writer of the Year, Mr Chris Cook. Hey, um, so uh, I tuned in last week to Parliament TV hey. and watched George Eustace MP for Cornwall constituency, um, who'd secured a, a quite an interesting debate um, about aftercare of our former racehorses. Uh, he was prompted because there's a, a rehoming, retraining centre in his constituency, uh, which in the last year or two is just finding it really difficult to keep paying for everything. Um, and so he decided, you know, on behalf of them, he'd try and find out who, which body in racing is responsible for funding these various rehoming centres around the country. Um, and he started off with the levy board and, and got passed on to, I think it was retraining of racehorses who moved him on to the Racing Foundation, who passed him on to the Horse Welfare Board, who told him they don't have any money. Um, and he sort of told that story to, um, to Parliament during this debate last week. Um, and, it, it, you know, listening to the way he expressed it, he's obviously not completely familiar with horse racing. He's not been a sort of devoted fan or anything like that. So you're getting a sort of outsider's perspective. Uh, it, it was it sort of made you blush a little bit, you know, because it sounded so like horse racing, you know, not not one person just standing yeah. up and saying, you know, well, this is how we deal with this. Um, so he was being handed around and got nowhere. Uh, his eventual argument that he made to Stuart Andrew, the sports minister um, presiding over that debate, was that we, sh we should be taking £12 million a year from the levy board that would normally go to prize money and uh, giving that to the aftercare sector because... Uh, he made the point, which I think almost everyone would agree with, it's really important to look after these x race yeah. horses um, once they stop doing a job for the game. Um, no one would argue. Um, I think the sport made it clear just a few years ago that this is going to be a point of emphasis in the future. Um, but we haven't quite nailed down our strategy. Um, and David Catlow, um, who's running retraining of racehorses now, um, confirmed to me after the debate, you know, um, it, that George Eustace is right, you know, the sport does not adequately fund the aftercare sector and we're going to have to find a way of doing that in the future. Um, the ROR have got a new strategy that's going to be published in January, um, you know, we don't have the details of that yet, but um, you know, David says there's going to be something for us to, to chew on 
um, early in the new year. Um, and it, it feels to me like it can't come soon enough because, you know, I'm very conscious that when, particularly when the Grand National comes around again, you know, we're going to be back in the public eye in the way that we were in April gone by. Um, you know, regardless of what the animal welfare activists decide to do this time in terms of a protest, that debate is definitely going to be revived again because, you know, all media outlets will be aware of what a big hit it was the last time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as a sport, we better have our answers straight. Um, you know, we need to be clear about what the plan is for how we're going to take care of our former racehorses um, and how, you know, anything that needs money in that direction um, is going to be funded. There are lots of good stories that can be told because, you know, lots of people in the sport do that job quite well already in a way that doesn't get a large amount of publicity. And I try and tell those stories when I can. I was writing about Foxtel just last yeah. week. Um, who's been found a good home, you know, after he's he's just been retired. Um, but, you know, those stories tend not to attract headlines. They, you know, horses tend to end up with people who aren't seeking headlines. Um, but so that does happen to a certain extent. You, it's just, you know, that you need to be sure there needs to be a sort of systematic way of handling these things and there needs to be traceability. I mean, it was in the Horse Welfare Board's publication, A Life Well Lived, I think almost four years ago. Yeah. that we should be aiming for full traceability of what happens to our racehorses and where they go so that we can be sure that they've got a good life afterwards. Um, and that's proving quite difficult because, you know, there's no law in the land that says once you've bought a horse, you have to report to anybody. Um, so ROR are sort of trying to organise traceability by attraction. You know, they're trying to give incentives to people to keep in touch with them and let them know what's happened to these horses. Um, but on the budget that they're operating with just now, you know, a, a project of that scale is just not feasible at the moment. So, I mean, it feels like full traceability is a fair way off, considering that we were, you know, confidently aiming in that direction years ago. So there's work to be done. Um, and, you know, so the MP was asking for 12 million a year. Um, I think Stuart Andrew was realistic without wanting to kill his hopes right away that, you know, British racing has need of the prize money that already exists and we, we're not in a position to just be giving away huge chunks of it. 12 million would more than fund Royal Ascot. Um, but some money is going to have to be found from somewhere to, um, to make sure that aftercare projects work. Uh, and there are various ideas. Nigel Payne had quite an interesting letter in our paper at the weekend saying, you know, there's, there's two obvious ways you could do it. You could, for every racehorse that starts out at the beginning of its career, you could have its owners commit a sum, maybe £5,000, just to help buffer it into some sort of next career or new home. Um, or as in Australia, you could have a percentage of prize money for each race that goes into a pot that sort of generally funds aftercare for all racehorses. Um, or there may be other options, but you know we do need to decide on something. Yeah, we do. Um, and that, that point that you make regarding the Grand National, um, I think it is key because when we get to a situation like that, the sport has to be able to uh, present a clear, unequivocal, positive message about um, its, its, its work in relation to the welfare of horses, both during racing, before racing and after racing. And if we're in a situation where a parliamentarian, even a parliamentarian who doesn't really understand the politics of racing or its structures, if that parliamentarian is asking key questions about who is responsible for this and where is the money coming from, if he keeps getting passed from person to person to person, that is not a, 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 an acceptable situation. No, and it's a terrible look and it just feels a little bit like giving opponents of the sport, almost handing them another stick with which to beat it. Yeah. Um, this is something that ought to be watertight already. The fact it isn't is disappointing, but like you say, fun, there's no magic money tree. These things require funding, they require concerted effort, but it ought to be top of the to-do list to get this sorted. And there's no reason why horses shouldn't be traceable from day dot to their last day. Yeah. That, I, that, should be, that should be where the line in the sand is drawn today, and then everything is working towards achieving that goal. Yeah. But in a measurable way. You know, reading that Life Well Lived document was great and it was really promising and it had all these wonderful ideas and it's incredibly well-intentioned, written by well-intentioned people, but where is it? It should, be, it should be a case of you almost Google what happens to racehorses, there's a landing page that just has you X, Y and Z, completely traceable, completely transparent, 
Next question, please. Yeah. I mean, that particular document, there was an issue, I think it was published like two months before the COVID pandemic. So, I mean, that was why yeah. the, the gears got gummed up immediately thereafter, but we need to start making some progress now. We do, and although you know, there are lots of positive stories, as you told with, with, with Foxtel, equally, I, I was sent an email a couple of weeks ago about her filly who had been in training this year, ran relatively recently in the autumn, was then sold, and I, I was presented with pictures of her not looking in a in a great state, and that was six weeks after she'd left training. Now, that the, the person who emailed me also emailed uh, the Horse Welfare Board, and emailed the, the, the filly's former trainer and therefore hopefully that, that trainer will now make efforts to uh, alert the yeah. horse's former owners and, and something will get done. But there clearly are lots of cases, sadly, um, that the sport wouldn't want to publicise. And We don't know about lots. Well, no, certainly some. Yeah, you're quite right. We shouldn't we should over-exaggerate. But the problem is we don't know. Without, without that, um, no. w w without that, that, that what's called cradle to grave uh, ability to monitor horses, we, we don't that, know. That is a big part of the problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, su I suspect that once we've got all of our systems in place, you know, in an ideal situation, we'll actually find that we're in a position to tell lots more good news stories. Which is what it, we want. It, to do. it will become clear that. Yeah. You know, the extent of all those efforts that aren't publicised just now will, will become clear, and that'll be a good thing. But yeah. we've got to get there. We do. Uh, and although there isn't any magic money tree, there are ideas. You referenced Nigel Payne's suggestions, which, which, which both sound really interesting. Um, I wrote a piece in the, in the, in the Racing Post last year uh, just highlighting the fact there's no formal connection between uh, the, the sales ring money made in the sales ring yeah. and the sport and I suggested could there be some sort of sales ring levy on horses that that go through the ring that the sales houses um, pay um, perhaps in, in connection with 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 vendors you could do that in a way that doesn't kick in until horses sell for a certain amount so that those who aren't making any money out of the sport aren't caught up into it but I think there's Pro this progressive this taxation exactly. that's what that's called yeah like right. it uh, and it's from, from those who have to those who need. I like that as well. Write it down. Um, it sort of links this and the Premier Racing story in that um, when the sport goes to the levy board and says, well, we'd like some cash, please, to, to market Premier Racing, the levy board is entitled to say, well, have you actually looked at every conceivable way that you can already uh, bring in new money to the sport? And when the sport goes to the government and says, well, we'd like you to um, look at ways to change the levy system, please. The government could say, well, have you looked at every other conceivable way that you could find new source sure. of revenue? And this is a potential source of revenue. Nigel Payne's ideas are potential sources of revenue that seemingly haven't yet um, been looked at properly. Um, and that's, I think, something as well that, that the sport has to really think hard about. Has he explored all avenues and if it hasn't, it needs to, because this is really important, isn't it? Yeah, and um, I think also there's a tremendous amount of goodwill out there um, towards retired racehorses. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even if you were to do something like uh, you tell every race who comes in through the gates that you know, 50p of the, your ticket price today has gone towards yeah. retraining of racehorses, um, I'm sure you know people would be delighted to hear about that. You know, in the same way that they, you know, people love to sort of chip a bit of money into the injured jockeys fund. Um, particularly at this time of year because you know they know that these sportsmen take a battering for the sport that they love um, and I, I'm sure that that same goodwill would be there for, towards the horses as well so yeah. I, this, I, hopefully this is a good news story waiting to happen yeah let's hope it is um, okay three stories done we're gonna wrap things up in a second but before I do we have a special offer to uh, new potential new members of the Racing Post Members Club Members Club is now available on the Racing Post app. All Members Club subscribers can now access premium news and tips anytime, anywhere. Plus, if you're not already a member, you'll get 50% off your first three months. If you haven't already subscribed yet and want to join the greatest club in racing, simply visit racingpost.com forward slash subscribe. Okay, time then now to bring this week's show to a conclusion. As ever, it is the job of the person sitting in this particular chair to determine who has the the winning story. Uh, John, here we go again. Next, not going well. Um, 
a fantastic racing over the weekend and uh, some disturbing stories as well one disturbing story in relation to what happened at Aintree um, so a strong case made for you there um, I think obviously my, my, my premier racing story uh, and the lack of marketing money for it and the whole marketing situation and promotion situation around premier racing is of of great significance and importance and concern however I would say there is nothing more concerning for British racing mm. than if it's not spending enough money and doing the right things with that money in relation to how horses are treated beyond their racing careers and therefore so I'm going to maintain your care on the yes, front absolutely, okay, yeah. good. I'm going to maintain your, 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 your period of great success which will no doubt carry on and on and on now it ends here I'm sure by awarding you this week's winning well, story fair enough but I mean um, we were all at the Derby Awards last week when your story about Premier racing funding uh, broke and it was interesting to see some uh, senior figures in the sport sort of hurriedly made their exit at about that moment Did to sort of go and put together some sort of response so yeah that was interesting well that, that is that is interesting that, that's your win right there i think well that, that is that is most rewarding but by, by then I'd, I'd already um uh, vacated the scene so i'm pleased that um that, that had an impact well what, what a lovely way to finish the program um, I have been and remain, Lee Mottisett, uh, my colleagues Chris Cook and Jonathan Harding were spectacular contributors to this week's show. We will be back with an end of year special very soon, look out for that. But until then, and um, with early festive greetings to you, goodbye. <laughs>